Hi everyone, so this week we are talking about belonging. So this is our third life skill um, out of the six that we'll be talking about in this course. And so um, I first wanted to say that by age five, a child's cultural self is already established um, according to Dr. Fitzgerald. And so with that, you know, a, a child's first introduction to the classroom, right, for a young child, it can be confusing and uncomfortable. And we can we can see that, you know, through observations when they enter the room um, due to the differences from their home culture. Um, and yet, as we know, children are, you know, very adaptable. Um, and they, you know, most children uh, adapt, um, you know, to the classroom and start to feel comfortable, um, you know, rather quickly. Um, and start to see, you know, the classroom is just another home away from home. And so part of this lecture, we'll be talking about like, how, how can we support that feeling in children, you know, making it feel like, um, you know, a home away from home, um, you know, for all, right? And so um, another thing I wanted to mention too, is it can be pretty easy for us to forget like how different children's lives can be, um, you know, their home lives, their home cultures from the classroom for, for, and from ourselves too, right? And so, um, you know, their traditions, their histories, their living conditions and relationships, right? And so it's really imperative that we really start there in respecting all the differences. Um, I think another key point to that is, also, um, acknowledging that these differences, um, you know, could be why there's behavioral, um, things that we might think are behaviorally inappropriate, or, um, maybe there's behavioral concerns and it could be from their, you know, home culture and, um, you know, hope, hoping to also build the empathy base, um, and, you know, reduce the, um, or improve our frustration tolerance as the um, adult in the room. So I wanted to play this cute little clip on Be a Mr. Jensen. I think it's really ins inspiring and motivational. I have a lot of memories from when I was a child. One that's always stuck out to me though was when I was about 10 years old and I was in school, and I struggled. And I, I didn't struggle with English, math, or science. I struggled holding still. And I would try to listen and focus and process ideas, but I couldn't help myself. And to be honest, I would sit there, and then I would just start tapping. And the students in the class would look at me, and they'd say, hey, stop tapping. A lot of the time, I didn't even realize I was doing it. And then eventually even the teachers got after me and they would yell at me and they'd say, Clint, you have to stop tapping. It got so bad that I got sent to the principal's office for tapping. And he said to me, okay, maybe when you go back to class, just try sitting on your hands. So I did, I went back to class and when I felt myself starting to tap, I just, I did this, I sat on my hands. And that worked for about five seconds. One time I was tapping in class and my teacher, Mr. Jensen, he looked at me and he yelled. And he said, Clint, stay after class. And I thought to myself, this is it, I am done. Now I've always been the type of person that believes that a single moment in time can change a person's life. And this was one of those moments for me and I will never forget it. And so I was sitting there with Mr. Jensen and an empty classroom. He walked past me and he sat next to his desk and he said, Clint, come here, I want to talk to you. And as he looked me right in the eye, he said, now I need you to know something, you're not in trouble. But I do have just one question that I have to ask you. And he asked, he said, have you ever thought about playing the drums? And in that moment, Mr. Jensen, he leaned back and he opened the top drawer of his desk. And he reached in and he pulled out my very first pair of drumsticks. And he held them in his hands and he looked at me and he said, Hey, Clint, you're not a problem. I think you're a drummer. From that moment on, I've never put those sticks down. 
toured, recorded, and played drums all over the world. My whole college education was paved for with drumsticks in my hand. Just because of a single moment in time when somebody believed in me, and he saw something in me that I didn't even see within myself. And from that moment, I learned that there's a difference between being the best in the world and being the best for the world. So, you know, when I watched this, I really felt his pain. Um, even him just retelling it like as an adult, right? This story of um, how upsetting it was that he didn't feel a sense of belonging, you know, from his teachers. Um, it was, uh, you know, his tapping, his, his, just his way of being, right? Um, that he felt like completely out of control of. And uh, he felt like he was wrong for it. And he excelled in other areas, you know, school. Yet he, you know, wasn't accepted for basically who he was, right? And because of that, like, causing, you know, irritations with the teacher, now children are even, you know, um, frustrated, right, with him. And so, you know, when you take that sort of approach, this, like, control approach, with which we've talked about in other lectures, right, of you really can only control yourself, um, not really control, you know, the other people around you. And, you know, if you sit there and try to control something that one doesn't really necessarily even need to be controlled, him tapping, um, or like maybe there's other, you know, things we can help him with, right? Think out of the outside of the box here. Um, if we do that, it, he will also, that's us modeling, right? And so it's like that he'll also be viewed differently from his peers in a, you know, in a positive way. And, um, you know, it just, it's inspiring how just like one teacher supporting him, uh, supporting his belonging life skill, right? It changed, um, everything for him and really guided him in life. So, um, yeah, I just thought that was such a, such a feel good story. Oops, it skipped. Okay, there we go. All right, so first on the topic of belonging is talking about how to support the family belonging. And so, you know, tying in children's familial culture. And so a lot of those questions you can um, ask your families through different projects. Or, you know, you can by just getting to know them and be asking questions. But you can also be doing different, like, kid projects that maybe include the parents, um, you know, and, you know, I, I just got a project recently for my uh, son who's in TK and, you know, for beginning of the school year. And, you know, it was um, a drawing. It's like a drawing booklet, right? And it's, it's different things uh, that have to do with culture. Um, and, and for him to draw and kind of do with me. So not only is it supporting family belonging between my, you know, myself and my son while doing it together, the activity, but also for the teacher to really get to know about the child as well. Right. And, and, the, and his family, uh, my son's family. And so, you know, some questions that are important to, to know the answer to, right. Are, uh, what does the family call the child? Who lives in the household and what does the child refer to them as? Um, what are the family's goals for the child in school? How does the family teach their child to behave? Um, what is the child interested in, right? What are their talents? And so these are just such crucial things to know about because um, all families look very different, right? And um, different people mean different things to them. And so I know personally my you know, family unit, my children have a lot of very close people to them that aren't, um, maybe like the typical name. So like for my, my parents spend a lot of time with my children and, you know, they, they're referred to as Nona and Papa. And so I've already, you know, um, established that with my, um, son's teacher, at least for his TK. Um, and, uh, let's see what else I was going to say. Oh, and 
you know, and just knowing what a child is interested in, you know, it's so important because that's how you can maybe get them to engage, right, in in class or help them kind of, you know, do, you know, break the ice when it's the, you know, start of working with them or um, even being able to kind of tie some children together, right? Like knowing, oh, this, you know, new child likes trucks, so does, um, you know, Jimmy. And so, it's really helpful to have these sort of answers. Um, and just some, you know, items here um, I had taken from the text that I found helpful is, um, you know, common preschool early, early learning standards and practices, and then contrasting beliefs and values of some families, right? And so sometimes we have these, we have these uh, standards and practices, right? And then um, there might be like family culture items that don't align. And we might see it as like, oh, this is an issue. Um, if we didn't understand that there was a cultural difference, right? Um, and so, you know, one point here is children develop independence in personal care routines and performance of tasks. Absolutely. That's a great um, you know, standard and practice, right? And depending on the child development level, what that looks like. Um, and then a contrasting belief and value of some families might be that children uh, accept help from and assist others in personal care routines and tasks. Um, another one might be children learn to regulate their own behaviors. And then, you know, the contrasting belief to that is in a it's an adult responsibility to regulate your child's behavior or to regulate young children's behavior, right? Um, several others are, let's see, children take pride in, oh, they're the same. I'm so sorry about that. They're supposed to be two different ones, but um, I accidentally put the same on here. But then the last one I'll say is, you know, children take pride in individual achievement um, and then the contrasting belief uh, could be that children use their talents uh, to contribute to the welfare of the group, which is really sweet. So just keeping in mind some of those points. So it's also important, I mentioned this just slightly, but more in depth um, here is learning about the family structure for your children that you work with. And so finding out early on how the family would like this also communicated with the child um, because you don't want to add an element that might be confusing, uh, you know, to the child if, you know, if not necessary. Um and so family structures all can look different. And so when I'm talking about family structures, I mean, like, is it a two-parent household? Um, what does that two-parent structure look like, right? Um, is it two fathers? Is it two mothers? Um, is it two parents not married, married? Um, you know, are there two sets of families that, you know, the child lives with? Um, or is it... You know, the child also lives with, um, you know, generations of family, of family members and, and maybe some aunts or uncles or cousins or, you know, grand, grandparents, right? And so it's, it's just helpful to know these things and then also to take into account um, these differences. And, you know, I, I, I mentioned all these different structures, but then I also for, forgot to mention that sometimes there's lacking of these, right? Not all children have a mom, not all children have a father. And to some children, this can be very traumatic. Um, and to some, it might not be right. It might be just what they know and they're okay with, but you know, some, it could be due to trauma and it could be that they were removed from their home and they lost both their mom and dad. Right. Um, and that they don't see them often or consistently or, you know, they don't live with them. Um, or they lost one, um, you know, to death, things like that. And so just keeping those kinds of things in mind, um, you know, to ensure activities that you do have, like for Mother's Day and Father's Day and Christmas presents, they take into account these differences. And so it's important to know about these family structures, but I would say so often we 
you know, in the classroom, we don't give enough time to know them or if I feel uncomfortable knowing them. And so there's always ways we can ask these questions or find out more, right? Without it be, being coming, becoming, uh, coming off as intrusive. Um, you know, it, we can be coming off more as, Hey, I just want to know how to support the child. Um, and I want to make sure that everyone's included in these activities, but regardless, I think it's important around these holidays to always keep in mind that there might be a family structure in your classroom that you don't even know about. And it's important to keep these, you know, activities open to celebrate someone else, maybe in their family. Right. And so maybe for Mother's Day, um, it's not their mom, but it's, it's it's a woman in their life that they want to celebrate, right? And that, that does motherly things for them. And they just want to say thank you to or give back to, um, you know, things like that. Okay. So some ways you can help support family belonging in the classroom is having family photos displayed. Um, I do see this a lot at preschools. I don't see this as often in, I haven't seen it in TK yet, um, and I haven't seen it, um, you know, a few grades up from there, kindergarten and first, second. But um, yeah, I think it's really wonderful to have some family photos displayed and, you know, make sure there's a photo for each child and um, really express that importance that, you know, children's families. Um, you know, this helps because it helps feel like the children have, like, that that part of their home culture, you know, is 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 in the classroom and that there's this connection, um, that that there's that you know familiar face right right there still in that classroom when they're not even with you, um, you know, is really sweet and wonderful. It also just shows like you know, the family cultural differences, right, amongst all of their classmates right there. And kids can show each other who's who and things like that. And they get, you know, they can feel very proud to share those things. Um, other things you might want to do is you can ask families to donate household items um, or magazines or picture books um, and even like music. Uh, like different cultures have different like lullabies, right, you could incorporate into the classroom. Um, not only this helps children learn from other cultures, which is, you know, incredibly important in normalizing differences, uh, but it's, it also helps those children who have had those items, um, you know, donated, uh, feel very comfortable and familial, uh, you know, to that environment in the classroom. Um, another thing you can do is have books in all the languages spoken by the children you have in your class. Um, you could even encourage like a parent who speaks, uh, you know, a, langu a language other than English, come in and do story time and, and read that book in the class um, in that language. Another thing is um, having children engage in projects that promote sharing on their family's cultures. So that's really neat too. And, and like I said, you know, kids love, kids love sharing on that, all that stuff. So some other ways you can help support um, belonging in the classroom for children is, uh, you know, one is welcoming new kids to the classroom. So this might be at the beginning of the year when they're all new, or it might be that there's just a brand new kid when everyone else has become more used to the classroom culture. You know, they've um, assimilated, they are comfortable you know, they've made friends and connections with the adults, and then there's a new kid, right? And that can be very scary um, entering that. Um, and so some things you could do to help um, them feel more comfortable is assigning different partners throughout the day to help the child. So um, one, it helps put the children who are uh, not new to the class feel like a great role of, in, in they get to show off what they've learned, right? And, and their growth of like, yeah, I used to be scared too. And now I know what to do in this routine of the day. 
um, and they get to show it off, right? And 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 give back and grow those attachments, and so that's really wonderful. Um, another thing it does is it helps already promote more peer interactions for the new child. Um, and um, another thing is having already personalized spaces for the child to increase inclusivity and feeling welcomed. And so, you know, ensuring that there's already maybe you guys, you know, maybe you have a cubby at the front. And so already having, you know, their name on that cubby right there, or if there's like a board with all the kids' names, um, already having the new child's name there to help them feel welcomed. Um, and then you can also have children in the classroom review the structure or the rules uh, during group time, you know, like, oh, you know, Claire, could you share, um, you know, with uh, Stone, who's new to the class, um, you know, what, what, what we do when it's time to um, get up from our mats, right? Um, you can also assign classroom jobs and that also supports uh, you know classroom community and there's so many different unique classroom jobs you can do um, and in look up and I, I love how many how unique they can be um, you know and build community as well. All right, so transitional objects. This topic is very big with me because I, I do have a big, um, I have a background in working with children in foster care. And so children who um, really benefit from having transitional objects, um, you know, can be children who have experienced trauma or have like attachment needs. Um, and maybe they have like an anxious attachment and that transitional object, it just helps ensure them, right, um, that, that they're safe. Um, it, it helps them feel like this piece from home can go with me to school, can go with me to, you know, a babysitter's house or their grandparents' house um, and they feel more safe, right, with that piece. And... This could be for children who haven't experienced trauma too. It's just, it's a lot, it's just very critical for children who, let's say, have moved house to house or they haven't had stability. But this one piece with them, you know, is stable and they don't want to lose it. And so it's important when working with young children. Um, this is where our own personal culture might or our adult mind might be like, nope, no personal toys in the classroom. Um, which I've heard. And I know in my daughter's second grade classroom, uh, you know, drop off for the first day, this girl asked, you know, can I, can I bring my stuffy out? And the teacher just said, nope, no personal items. They stay in the backpack all day, which I understand the reasoning for that. But sometimes let's, instead of dismissing so quickly, you know, maybe you want to find out a little bit more information on why she wants that stuffy with her. And I would imagine first day nerves, right? And um, maybe there's a connection there that you could actually help support. And I, I found it also interesting that um, they couldn't bring anything in the classroom if it even helped uh, with sensory, you know, sensory issues or sensory needs um, or, you know, ADHD items. And so that's just something, you know, I wanted to, you know, have a conversation with her about, but that's a different topic. But, um, you know, for transitional objects, still children are still learning the concept of like object permanence, right? And so, that's why it's so helpful for these objects to kind of go from home, and then even sometimes you'll see kids, uh, you know, take little trinkets from the classroom right? To bring home. And, and it's just these transitional objects of kind of like school coming home with them. And so that's really sweet. And there's things you could do where like maybe it's, um, you know, more of a controlled where you don't lose like all of your, um, I don't know, really cool, like, you know, Hot Wheel cars or something from your classroom because, um, you know, they keep taking, kids keep taking them or Legos, right? Things like that. Um, I know, by the way, my son takes stuff home all the time from school and we have to bring it back. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's comfort, right? And it's, they're still learning this concept of um, object permanency.
Um, I just wanted to say, by the way, this is a picture of my daughter and I, but this was like a few years ago. You know, she's a, she just turned seven, but this is crocodile in the photo and this crocodile, my daughter does get very, um, she's very outgoing, but she does get very nervous. And so this crocodile has helped her through so many situations and I've always been so fearful of like her losing it because there's not a backup, um, but she just loves it and it brings her so much security and a sense of safety. Um, and I don't know why she chose that to be that, you know, piece for her, but it is. And uh, she, she chose us at probably two, maybe two and a half. Um, and still to this day, you know, she sleeps with him every single night and she's got other ones, you know rotations right of stuffed animals that um, provide her security but this kiddo this guy right here you know she um, just loves and sleeps with every night and anyone in her life knows about crocodile and she was actually croc a crocodile once for Halloween too I think her fourth birthday So I also wanted to talk about um, supporting the development of friendships. And so um, we can help children learn to play um, by joining in the play ourselves, right? And that's through like modeling and coaching for other children. And so it's really one of those like what children see is what they do, right? So how we speak to children is how they speak to children. Um, and so really one of the best tools is really getting on a child's level and playing. Um, this also can really teach them like the value of friendships and then in friendship skills. A commonly made statement uh, I've heard in classrooms and is, you know, we are all friends in our class. And it's with good intention, of course, um, but I would say that there's di some dishonesty to it because even kids kind of know, like, well, no, like I kind of don't. There's someone who I constantly have an issue with, or or maybe or maybe not, but there's you know certain kids that I really connect with, um, and so I don't think we are all friends, right? And so we could um, kind of change that statement a little bit to be a little bit more honest and achievable uh, for the classroom norm, which is we are all friendly in our class or just something around those lines, right? Um, another thing we hear or might say ourselves all the time um, is, you know, be nice or be friends. And I know as a parent, I am always saying be nice, um, but realistically it is vague, right? If you like look down at it, I mean, if you break it down, what does that mean? Like, um, you know, it's not, it's not really specific. Right. And so what's better than saying just be nice or be friends is, um, you know, really helping children develop an understanding of, uh, friendly behaviors, um, by commenting on, um, them when you see them. So you could be like, Oh, Sarah, you know, that was just, so nice when you offered, um, you know, your juice to Claire because Claire dropped her juice. Um, you know, it was really sweet of you or, you know, that was very friendly of you, right? You could even use those key terms. Um, so that helps children develop. Oh, okay. Like that's a friendly behavior instead of just being like, you know, be friendly. Um, we can always also help point out to a child when another child is being friendly to them, which I just said, <laughs> and uh, assist child assist children in noticing similarities between each other. So that can be helpful um, when we notice, you know, two kids are alike in some way, um, either you know internally or maybe it's um, you know interests, um, and. We can also recognize and then normalize the unique differences between children um, without it being seen in a negative light, right? Because you might have some children going, why does so-and-so do that? And, and kind of have like a tone of like, I don't like it because it doesn't feel 
normal or doesn't feel right to me, right? Because it's different for me. So through, you know, children, young children, they see everything through their lens, right? And so something that they don't know about just might feel wrong, right? And so, um, you know, we can help them uh, just, yeah, recognize it as different, you know, um, but normalize it and just kind of like show that it's kind of cool that we're all different, right? And that we all have different things and that's normal to that child, right? And what you do might be different also, uh, feel different to them. Um, I would just say, you know, for an educator, it's just so important uh, to facilitate, like, children's friendships, um, you know, just as much it, as it is to teaching, you know, them letters and numbers. I think some children just can easily jump right into a social setting and not need much assistance, um, while others might struggle a little bit more, and they still need those friendships. They still thrive and they still want them right um they just might need some help from you and so uh i know from my personal experience i had with my daughter last year um for first grade um she i did a lot of uh, observ um, observations in that classroom and my daughter um she was having a really hard time with a peer and there was just so many opportunities for it to be um, a lesson, right, uh, to learn from and to grow from. Yet they never were, uh, unfortunately, you know, with high ratios too, you know, outside of the classroom on the playground and inside the classroom is, you know, they, those, those specific scenarios were never when the teacher was present or someone else. And so unfortunately they weren't like, you know, uh, utilized as learning moments to develop a potential friendship or at least, uh, you know, belonging between the two. Um, you know, when, when something challenging was happening, right. Um, it was very hard for the teacher to understand really what was going on cause they didn't see it, but my daughter would come home and just be crying. I mean, broken down crying and not understanding why she was just not accepted by this other child um, that she really wanted to be accepted by. Um, she was, you know, kind of the alpha, right, of the class with the other girls. And my daughter felt really left out. My daughter also has a very, like, dominant type of, um, you know, stance. And she likes to be in control. And I, so I think she was very feeling very left out, feeling very, like, not having a place. Um, and I just think this, this is a great example of where a teacher can go, okay, wait a minute, what's going on here? And, um, where they could incorporate more social, emotional development items within the classroom to help these connections. And remember these kids, uh, sure she's in first, she was, she was in first grade, but they're, they were COVID kids in terms of starting school. So it was like, almost like their first year of like being in the classroom. It was really, uh, you know, being in the classroom with their peers and, you know, and learning these social emotional skills that I think a lot of kids develop, um, you know, maybe in TK or kinder, um, but they just weren't because they were doing school online. Right. And so it was just such a critical year, um, for those to be happening. And I just weren't, wasn't like seeing them. And so, I think one example was um, like brain break. So between activities, um, the teacher would turn on a video, you know, a brain break they call them. And um, she would utilize that time to pick things up in the classroom. And listen, I know there's a lot to get done and they don't, it's not a, it's not a time to shame um, another you know, a, a teacher at all. Um, cause she could sure use some help in her classroom. Right. Um, but how that time could have been really used wonderfully was doing the brain break with the kids or maybe not having the video beyond maybe she led the brain break or maybe a ch another child or a group of children led the brain break. Right. 
And so you could help develop a sense of belonging and also friendships and then also be, um, you're playing, right? You're joining them um, and you're really getting to know them and then also observing when maybe something is going on. And so I would say from my observation was that the teacher um, was disconnected from the children um, in terms of like relational building she was wonderful teaching all the other, you know, skills of, um, you know, the classroom of, you know, math and science and reading and writing. But there was a, a deficit in the relational building. And, and I saw it with, um, you know, the connection between the children. And so there was this um, less connecting going on bet- with, you know, with the children and, you um, you know, that was, that was unfortunate. I also would say like, let children be children a little bit. So we also, you know, we don't want to get a class too rowdy. Um, but like, you know, there's, there's, there's a line of like, let's let the, ch- remember their children. Right. And so they, it might obviously get a little loud if there's 20 to 30 kids in a class. Um, and it's normal because it's, like there's that many people and they have higher pitched voices, right? And they're learning what's like, you know, acceptable volumes. Um, and just so if you're constantly silencing it because it's uh, upsetting for your ears or overstimulating for you, that's a time for you to check in with yourself. You know, is it me who's needing, uh, who is overstimulated, who is um, stressed? Um, or is it actually, yes, uh, too, you know, too crazy right now. We have to, um, you know, settle down a little bit. So I think that's important as well. Um, because if you're constantly, um, you know, every time children start to connect, um, you're just putting a, you know, nip in it. Um, you know, that's, that's a deficit for them, right? That's, that's not helpful in, in building those friendships. Um, and then they might not really know how to act appropriately on the playground either. Um, and then just some ways you can support different play types. So um, in the classroom, so, you know, so how you can support solo play. So I think having some solo play activities, it sounds ironic to talk about solo play when we're talking about belonging, but um you know, it can get overwhelming and overstimulating, right, in a classroom. So it can help. Maybe a child needs, you know, to have a little bit of solo play at a, at a moment. Um, some children do need it more than others. And just kind of recognizing and knowing that and letting that be okay. Um, and you'll just want to have these activities, like, you know, in the classroom, but they're set off to the side a little bit, right? And children can still, like, learn friendship skills, Um with, you know, with these activities, because there's like other nearby children, right? Um, or maybe there's, a, maybe there's a special partner they're playing with within that, but um, they're still, they're still listening, right? They're still observing, um, but they just need maybe a little bit more space and that's okay, right? Um, you can also do supporting dyad play. So, you know, dyad is two, right? So you could um, have activities that require two people or two kids, right? So, you know, with the big block, blocks and bikes and trailers, or um, you can even have just specifically like two settings, right, for things um, that require, you know, a team effort in it. Um, then there's also, you know, small group play areas where art tables and you can have like a specific, um, you know, maybe like four art spots set up. And this is where you could see like, you know, you have your different small group sections, right? And maybe you rotate. Um, and then, in, and then meal times, right? So for like preschools, you know, you might see there be like, you know, group one or group two and they get kind of, um, they get special time with, you know, special group of kids, right? That maybe they don't have their, um, they didn't do their art with, but, but they do do their meals with, um, within that too, that meal, you could do it like kind of family style too, right? Eating where, um, you know, they don't have like all individualized plates already that it's served, you know, family style. Um, and then lastly, um, you can help support large group participation. So, 
um, modeling, you know, and coaching, identifying peer mentors, um, you know, you can use front row seating, which, you know, for children that obviously children who might need it, right. And have them kind of move to the front. Um, you can assign like special tasks to help. And so, um, you know, there's different things you can do to help support like large group participation. Um, and then also, you know, be okay with, um, you know, if someone isn't needing, isn't wanting to participate in that large group either. And maybe there's something, um, you know, for like solo on the side that you can also have for them to, um, you know, engage in. Right. So it's, um, it's allowing them that space, but also, um, still part of, um, you know, the, the culture of the classroom and acceptable, right. As long as it's part of, you know, the rules and their routines, um, and they can get that space to get that, um, you know, get their regulation, uh, back if they need it. So that is it for the lecture. And then, uh, this, you know, this week we have, um, I'm sorry, next, uh, yeah, that's it for the belonging lecture. And then I'll go over, um, you know, class points, um, you know, separate. So thank you guys for listening.